What is up, my people? This is Mr. Tui, creator of the TSI Math Crash Course series. And I am so excited to announce that TSI Math Crash Course has been updated to reflect some of the newest concepts and question types students are seeing tested on the TSIA2 math exam. In this video, I'm going to teach you the easiest and fastest way to solve a number of those question types so you can easily pass the new TSIA2 math test with flying colors. Oh, and by the way, if you like this video, you definitely want to get access to the full version of the course. Just click the link in the description below to access the full version. In the meantime, sit back, relax, and enjoy these TSIA2 math answer explanations. All right, well, welcome everybody to TSI Math Crash Course. This is uh, day six, the day six update, really the update to the day six update for the TSIA2 uh, math test. And uh, we've got a student with us. This is Bailey. Say hi to everybody, please, Bailey. Hello. All right, thank you, Bailey. I appreciate it. So Bailey reached out to me um, a few weeks ago, and she had some questions that she'd seen on some practice tests that she was kind of unsure about. And uh, and I want to go over some of those those questions with her today. Also, there's some questions I've seen on some recent uh, TSI tests. Um, a couple concepts I was a little bit surprised to see that don't appear on the practice tests. And uh, I really haven't seen anywhere else, but I saw them on the actual test. So I've kind of recreated some versions of those questions. And, uh, and I want to go over those today. A couple new concepts uh, like absolute value and like stuff with trapezoids and graphing a circle on the XY axis and, and uh, just some more complicated geometry and things. So um, I want to go over all those questions here on this day six update just so that everybody watching uh, my videos has, uh, has a handle on the most recently released kinds of concepts and question types that are tested on the TSIA2 math test. So let's jump right into the questions. Bailey, we got a question up on the screen. Go ahead and read question number one for us and uh, we'll solve it together. Um, which of the following could be the equation depicted on the graph? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now you see, do you see any questions like this on the TSI where they give you like some line or a parabola and they're like, what's the equation of the graph? Is this familiar? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I definitely and, something like and this. you've re worked your way through, you know, the, the course as well. And there's lots of questions like this on the practice test. Now I generally recommend, uh, you know, just plug in the points from the xy axis right like even if it's a parabola right. or a line right you i mean you can kind of like think in terms of y equals mx plus b if it's a line if you're really comfortable with that but I, you know i always tell students just pick values from the xy axis and then plug those into the equations and that's just like the easiest most straightforward way to solve it generally and we can do that here as well in this question now what's kind of funky about this if you look at some of the answer choices here in this question look at answer choice a and b do you see those funky lines like around x minus one and x minus two, do you see that? Yes. Yeah. Have you seen that notation before? Have you seen those funky lines? Those are called absolute value lines or absolute yes, value bars. Yes, I yeah, have. I've seen those. Okay. Are you, do you know what absolute value means? Are you familiar with that? Um, isn't that like they're the same value outside of the lines? Like, well, let's, or... let, let's talk about it. Cause I've, I do, I have updated my uh, TSI math cheat sheet as well to reflect uh, absolute value because they're testing on it now on the TSI. So let's go to that cheat sheet. So open that up. You should have access to that. I'm going to zoom in yes. a little bit here. And then this is toward the end of the cheat sheet. This is basic concept I. I've kind of added this on. Absolute value. So kind of scroll down. It's like the second to last page. And let me know when you're there. All right. I'm here. All right. Great. Go ahead and read uh, that bullet point for absolute value, please. Calculate what's inside the bars. If it's positive, keep it positive. If it's negative, make it positive. Okay, good. And I've, I've got an example there of the absolute value of three minus five, the absolute value of three minus five. That's how you'd read that. And, uh, and so when you see absolute value, real simply, you can kind of deal with it like parentheses, kind of, you know, calculate what's inside the bars. And by the way, what's three minus five, Bailey? What does that equal? Uh, it's negative two. Yeah, it's a negative two, okay. And then if it's positive, you know, once you've calculated what's in the bars, you keep it positive. But if it's negative, you make it positive. OK, so three okay. minus five, like you said, is negative two. It is. But because it's inside those absolute value bars, you just got to make it positive. And that's why the absolute value of three minus five is two positive two. Does that make some sense? Yes. OK, if it were parentheses, not those straight bars, then it would be negative two, of course. But with those straight lines, just make make sure it's positive. Basically, calculate what's inside the bars. Whatever comes out of that is going to have to be positive. Does that make some sense? Yes. OK, great. So let's go back to the question up on the whiteboard. Okay. And, um, and, you know, we could, we could think in terms, like I, I said that earlier, of sort of, 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 of graphing, if you're familiar with like graphing lines, maybe you could graph C and D. Most yeah. students aren't super familiar with graphing absolute value. And I'm not even super comfortable with it. I'm not. 
So let's just take points from the x y axis. Let's just start with this point right here, sort of at the bottom of uh, of that v shape that appears on the graph. Okay. okay. What is that point right there, Bailey? Do you do you know how to describe that point in terms of x and y? Yeah, it's it's one comma two. Well, it's actually not. It's actually not one comma two. This is a common mistake students make. Um, so keep in mind oh. that when you see an ordered pair, it's going to be x comma y. The x oh, comes yes, first. Yeah. And if you forget, no, sorry, it's a super common mistake, and I mix them up sometimes too. Um, okay. Just think in terms of alphabetical order, right? Like x comes before y yes. in the alphabet, right? Like that's good enough, and and I recommend thinking in those terms. So, right. so what's the x value at that point? It's not one. What's the x value? It's, it's two. The x value is two, and what's the y value? Oops. Uh, it's one. It's one, absolutely. So that's the point two comma one. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. So we can test the answer choices just by taking that point two comma one and plugging it into the answer choices, calculating those, and the right answer has to give us a true statement. Okay. Now, if we get right. multiple true statements, then we'll just plug in another set of points. And that happens sometimes, um, you know. But I think two two comma one is going to work here to give us the answer. So. Let's plug that point in, 2 comma 1, remember that's x comma y, plug that into answer choice A, and let's just see what happens. Okay? Let's find okay. A, a spot on the whiteboard, and let's calculate that. Yes, okay. Can I write it down here? Is that right? Anywhere, yeah, anywhere you got space. Okay, so do you want to plug in the 1 for the y as well? Yeah, we plug in the 1 for the y and the 2 for the x. And I like when you, when you're doing absolute value bars, I like making them like real, like long, like obnoxiously long, just so they don't like, because otherwise it could look like 12. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or like, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Okay. But you're doing great. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't even put the equals in there. Yeah, um, I got you. I got you. So would it be like that? Yeah, yeah. So two minus one is one, positive one. What's the absolute value? Uh, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit here. Good. All right. So yeah, the absolute value of one is just one right here. Right. So you get one plus two, and that is three. So you get one equals three. So what do you think about answer choice A? Uh, no. Probably not. Right? <laughs> it's not, a, not a true statement. Last I checked. Uh, one does not equal three. That is correct. All right. So let's plug in answer choice B. I'll clear some space for you here on the whiteboard. And um, oops. clear that. All Thank right. you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Okay. Looking good, looking good. Yeah, so we get a true statement here, right? One equals one. And the absolute value of zero, for anybody watching the court isn't, isn't uh, certain about that, the absolute value of zero is just zero. It is. So um, so we get a true statement there for answer choice B. Let's keep it. Does that make sense, Bailey? Yes. Okay, great. Let's plug into answer choice uh, C, and let's see what happens. Click the space. <laughs> My handwriting is so bad with you're these. You're good, you're good, you're good. I can read it, I can read it. All right, true statement? No. Clearly not, right? So answer choice C is gone. And let's plug into answer choice uh, D as well. Clear the space. Yeah, not, not a true statement. Very simple. All right. So uh, we can confirm it's answer choice B. So I have seen uh, questions like this on the TSI with absolute value. And just be aware, if you've seen absolute value questions, it's always going to graph as like a V shape, basically. Okay. So it, just recognizing that, you can sort of like narrow it down to A and B. 
But I said, just always plug in the points and just kind of be aware of how absolute value works. Remember, just calculate what's inside the bars. If it's positive, you keep it positive. If it's negative, you make it positive. A lot of students kind of misinterpret it. They think you you flip the sign. And that's only true yeah. if it's negative. That's the only time you flip the sign. But if, if you get something positive inside the absolute value bars, you don't make it negative. It doesn't work that way. If it's positive, okay. keep it positive. If it's negative, make it positive. And you got a question like that. Did, did you see one like this on, on, a, on the TSI that you took recently? Or maybe not? Um. I didn't see one with absolute value or anything, yeah, but it's yeah. like definitely like depict the equation sort of thing. Yeah, Those are very, yeah. Very yeah. and th that applies to a lot of different kinds of graphs that they could give you. But I've seen it on recent tests, so there's a good chance that you could see it as well. So any questions about this before we move on? Uh, no, thank okay, you. Okay, great. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Aha, this is a factoring question. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And then go ahead and read uh, question number two when you see that up on the screen. Which of the following is a factor of the polynomial above? Ooh, what are we solving for here? Do you have any idea? Um, well, I know what a factor, but like, I don't know what it's asking like specifically, like yeah. what yeah. the final answer is yeah. of all of it. Yeah, if, if you're familiar with factoring, some students are. I hate factoring, by the way. And most students I work with as well, like, really struggle with factoring. It is, it's a pain in the butt operation. It really is. Um, but, like, there's a way to, like, basically break this polynomial, break it up into, like, two sets of terms in parentheses, basically, right, that you'd multiply together to get that polynomial. Right. That's underlying green. There, there's a way to do that. Um, I generally don't recommend doing that. It's just so easy to mess up, and it's such a specific operation. Um, there's a way to plug in values on these factoring questions. I know they're asking about the factors of some polynomial. There's always a way to plug in values. And that's what we're, we're going to do here. But first, let's talk about what a factor means. Let's start there. Bailey, do you, know what, do you know what a factor is, like the definition of a factor, or maybe not so much? I don't know what the definition of yeah, it is. No. Let, let's talk about it, because I think it's really helpful to understand what that is here to, to solve this question. Look at the number, uh, the number 12. Let's start there. Number 12... The number 12 has a variety of factors. That is to say, a, a factor is a number that you multiply with another number to get another number. <laughs> okay, so like there's some right. numbers that you could multiply together that give you 12. Okay, what are some of the numbers that you could multiply together to give you 12? Like four times three? Yeah, four times three. So both four and three are factors of 12. Does that make sense? But there's there's more. There's more factors of 12. What other factors are there? More numbers you multiply mean, together. I yeah. One and twelve. One and twelve. Um, Absolutely. One because one times twelve is twelve. So those are also factors. And there's more. There's a lot more. Yeah. What else? Um. Hold on, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Let me help you out a little bit. You could do six. Uh, and, six and two. Yeah, six and two. Exactly. Yeah. Six and two are factors. And then get this. Also, the negative versions of those numbers are also factors. So, like negative four is a fact. As a factor, because you multiply oh, negative fun. four times negative three. I know, right? There's a ton of factors, right? <laughs> yeah, negative one and negative 12, right? I mean, this doesn't, it's, it, can get, it can get involved. Negative six and negative two are also factors. I think that's it for the factors of 12. But basically, some numbers you, you multiply together to get another number, those are the factors. Does that make some sense? Yes. Yeah. And that's sort of easy to wrap your head around, I think, when you're dealing with, like, actual numbers. That's what we're doing with this question. We're turning it into, into arithmetic. But there are also some, like terms, algebraic terms with like, you know, X that we can multiply together to get the polynomial in the question. But it's the same idea, right? Terms that you multiply together to get another term. Does that make some sense? Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to plug in a value for X into this expression here in the question. Okay. I'm going to start with X equals one. We could start with zero. Uh, and this is usually, you know, ones and zeros are great. You've you worked your way through the course. You, you know, I love ones and zeros, right. but I know if I plug in a zero here, I'm not gonna be able to get rid of any of the answer choices just because I was, I've worked right. on this question previously here before, but uh, we can start getting rid of some with, with one. And I think when we plug in a two, for sure, we're gonna be able to get rid of all the wrong ones, but, but um, we're going to plug in a one for X into the expression in the question. We're going to find what that equals. We're going to get like a number when we plug in a one for X, okay? And then we're gonna plug that same value for X into the answer choices, and then we'll see which of those answer choices are factors of the number we got when we plugged a one into the expression. Does that okay. make a little bit of sense? Yes, it does. Okay, good, good. I think it'll be really, really clear as we, as we work through this. So let me clear some space here on the whiteboard. And then um, let me see you plug in a one for X into the expression in the question. Now be real careful when you're plugging here, I really recommend uh, using parentheses when you're plugging in, but just yeah. plug in a one for X into that three X squared plus 25 X minus 18. And let's just see what happens. Looking 
good, looking good. Great. I want to make it really clear to anybody watching the recording here. That means one squared right there. One squared. We're not squaring the three. We're just squaring the one. So that's three times one. It's kind of a common mistake. Students make a lot of students think this expression right here equals nine. But that doesn't equal nine. That's just three. Looking good. Looking good. Uh, now, hold on. I'm going to stop you real quick. I might have... Yeah, so what is, let's, let's, um, what's 25 minus 18? Um, it's seven. That should be seven, positive seven. Does that make some sense? Oh, my yeah. bad. Yeah, that's right. I mix up negatives. Boy, it, it happens a lot. Um, that's right. Yeah, so that should be three um, plus seven. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so the expression in the question equals 10 when X is one. Does that make some sense? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so let's plug in that one into the answer choices as well, and let's see which answer choice gives us a factor of 10, or which answer choices. We might get some multiple answer choices here. But let's plug in answer choice A. What do we get? You might even be able to do this mentally. What do we get uh, when we plug in a 1 for x into answer choice A? Negative, negative 8. Yeah, we get negative 8. Is that a factor of 10? No. No, that is not a factor of 10. So uh, answer choice A is gone. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Yeah, because you can't multiply negative 8 by some whole number and get 10. It's just not going to happen. All right, so uh, A is gone. <laughs> what about answer choice B? What do we get? Uh, 4. We get 4, positive 4. Uh, is that a factor of 10? No. It's not, right? Because you can't multiply 4 times some whole number and get 10. It's not a factor. So B is gone as well. Ooh, this is working out well. Uh, let's try answer choice C. What do we get? Let me see you plug this in. Yeah, sure. Yep, three minus two. What does that give us? Uh, one, so. Uh, yeah, that gives us one. So is that a factor of 10? Technically, yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Not just technically, it is a factor, right? Because you can multiply yeah. 1 times 10 and get 10. So C could be right. Let's keep it and let's plug in the answer choice uh, D. Uh, and 4 is not a factor. Yeah, you got 4. And 4 is not a factor. Oh, great. So we by plugging in a 1, we could get rid of all the wrong answers and we can confirm it's answer choice C. Woo! I thought we were going to have to plug in another number. We didn't need to there. One just worked great. Does that question make some sense now? Yeah, it's a lot easier than factoring. It's a lot easier than factoring. It's a lot easier than factoring. I mean, we could go over those operations. I, I have zero desire to. It's uh, every factoring question I've seen on the TSI, you can turn into arithmetic, and, and that's the case here. Okay. So, any questions about that? No. Okay. Do be aware. Sometimes you might get multiple answer choices that give you a true statement, right? Again, if we plugged in a zero... I just kind of want to take a look at this real quick. Uh, if we plugged in a zero for x into the expression in the question, what would we get? Oh, we get negative 18 if we plugged in a zero for x. Do you see why that would be the case? If x were yes. zero? Yeah. If x is zero, we get negative 18. Because that becomes zero, basically. That becomes zero. We're left with just negative 18. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then um, if you look at, if you plug in a zero into the answer choices, then you'd get, let's see, a would give you negative 9. That is a factor of negative 18. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, answer is B would give you 3, also a factor of negative 18, because you can multiply 3 times negative 6 and get negative 18. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. C would give you negative 2, also a factor, <laughs> and D would give you 1, right? So, like, that's why, like, and that happens sometimes. That's okay. Remember, this is an untimed test. you got all the time in the world, essentially. Um, so if you've got to plug in multiple values, you know, don't hesitate to do that. Be aware that's going to happen sometimes. So don't just stop when you see something that looks good. Make sure you're testing all the answer choices. And if you've got to plug in multiple values, uh, that's totally cool, totally normal. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. But here it is. Uh, it is answer choice C. We can confirm that by plugging in a 1 for X. All right, let's take a look at some of the next questions. We're talking about percents coming up and some percent increase and decrease. I've seen some of those questions popping up. Number three is kind of a real straightforward question, um, but I want to go over it just because 
I want to I want to understand how percents work before we get into some of the more complicated questions on percent increase and decrease and kind of review that. Uh, go and read question number three for us, please. A farmer plants 400 seeds in his garden. Which of the 85% sprouted? How many seeds sprouted? Yeah, it says of which 85% sprouted. So of those 400, 85% sprouted. Does that question make some sense? Yes. Okay. So I, I just want to kind of talk about this from a logical perspective right off the bat. Before we do an operation, we will get into the operations here. But, um, you know, we're, we're talking about some percentage of 400 that sprouted. Is the number of seeds that sprouted, is that going to be bigger than 400 or is that going to be less than 400? Uh, less than 400. It's got to be less than 400, right? I mean, 100% of 400 would be 400. But anything less than 100% is going to be a number smaller than 400. Does that make some sense? Yes. Yeah. So, like, right off the bat, we can get rid of at least one answer choice that doesn't make any sense. What answer choice can we get rid of? D. Yeah, we can get rid of D, right? Because that's just bigger than... Than 400, and that doesn't make any sense. So just you can think in those terms and start getting rid of some bad answer choices. I just kind of want to point that out. Um, okay. Now, um, notice, by the way, where they get answer choice D from, right? This is like, that's just like you're adding. They just add them. Yeah, right? Like, they love doing that. Be, you know, this is, I call this number slapping. Students do this a lot, where they're like, oh, I see a 485. Like, I'll just add those together. I'll just subtract those together, right? And, you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't, you know, I mean, no, don't, don't do that. You're, you're better <laughs> off, like, just feeling your way through it and really understanding the question than by just doing, like, a random operation with numbers. So, okay. Let's talk about the operation here because we can we can solve this pretty easily. If you understand what percents mean. Do you understand what 85% means, Bailey? I mean, it's eight, I mean, it's like the amount of the initial amount that, I guess, succeeded in a way. Like, yeah. I couldn't tell you the definition, but I know how to. Yeah, yeah. Most students, are familiar. you've got like an 85% on a test. You're like, okay, I got most of them right. I did it all right. I got like a B. Yeah. You know, you kind of know what it means. Now, there's a definition of percent, and I think I probably addressed this like way back on day one of the course. But uh, percent means per 100 or out of 100. I think it's really helpful to understand right. that. Like cent means 100. That's It's a Latin for 100. Bailey, how many years are there in a century? Do you know? Uh, isn't it? Uh, no. No, that's <laughs> no. right. That's right. Well, I'll help you out. That's okay. There's 100 years in a century. There's 100 years in a century. How about this? How many cents are there in a dollar? How about that? Uh, 100. 100 cents, right? That's where it comes from. There's 100 cents in a dollar. So it's a cent. I did not know that. Yeah, right? Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. So 100 years in a century. A decade has has uh, 10 years. Ten. Some students, yeah, yeah, some students get decades and centuries mixed up. But deca means 10, right? And you actually see that sometimes in math. Yeah. We're talking about like a deciliter or something like that. But uh, but anyway, but so 85% means 85 out of 100. That's what it means. Okay, literally. Right. Does that make sense why? Yes. Okay, great. So 85% is 85 out of 100. Now, if you've got a calculator, which you should have on a question like this on the TSI... And I don't know if you've got a calculator you know, with you right now or you've got like an iPhone or something like that. I want you to punch that into the calculator. Punch in 85 divided by 100 and tell me what you get. You'll get a decimal that's the same as 85%. Yeah, you get 0.85. You get 0.85. So I really want you to understand this. 85% equals 0.85. It is 0.85. It's the same thing. So if you ever want to find 85% of something, all you got to do is just multiply the original value by 0.85, and then you'll find 85% of it. And that's all the questions asking us here. We're just finding 85% of two, of 400. We'll multiply 400 times 0.85. Do that in your calculator real quick. Tell me what you get. We should get the right answer. It's 340. 340. Answer choice C. Does that make some sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you, have, if you want to find like, I don't know, like 15% of something, what would you multiply by? Let's just talk about it. Um... You would multiply by 15% uh -huh. out of 100. Yeah, so it's 15 divided by 100. What is 15 divided by 100? Punch in your calculator real quick. It's 0.15. Yeah, 0. 0.15, 0. 0.15, right? So just, if you want to find 15% of something, multiply by 0. 0.15. If you want to find 50% of something, all right, it's just half of it, multiply by 0. 0.5, 0. 0.50. If you want to find 60% of something, just multiply by 0. 0.6. If you want to find 65% of something, just multiply by 0. 0.65. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you see a question like this where they're like, hey, what percentage of this value or what's the percentage of this value um, or what value would be a percentage of this value, then just multiply by that percent and, and that's it. Questions about that? Does that make some sense? That makes sense. Okay. It's a pretty straightforward question. I have seen some of these um, on the practice tests that are that are the simple 
Um, you know, I wouldn't expect to see this maybe on the first set of 20, maybe on the on the diagnostic section, if you end up with the diagnostic section, you don't pass that first set of 20. But I still want you to know how it works because, you know, so I have seen some questions like this where you've got to, like, draw out some information on a chart. I think on the most recently released practice test, it's there's like a percent increase gotcha. question or like a fifth increase or something like that. But it works the same way, yeah. um, you know, and uh, um, and that, but you have to know how percents work and what they mean to be able to get the percent increase and decrease questions, which are a little more complicated. Those are coming up right now. Any questions about this before we move on? No. Okay, great. But just know what percent means, and then and then you can you can navigate it. All right, let's talk about percent increase. All right, go and read uh, question number four. Let me see it on the screen, Bailey. Uh, a company with 140 employees estimates that the next year of employees will increase by 35% next year. Um, according to the estimate, how many people will be employed by the company next year? Ooh, what, what are we solving for here, Bailey? Um, how many people will be employed in the company next year? How, how many will be employed by the company next year? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if we just look at the question carefully, we know that number of employees is going to increase by 35% next year. Okay, so are we talking about more than 140 employees or less than 140 employees next year? Uh, more. There's got to be more than 140, right? And like just knowing that, by the way, we can get rid of two answer choices that are just ridiculous if you understand what that means. What, what answers yes. can we get rid of right off the bat? Uh, a and B. A and B are gone. Absolutely. And I think where, where answer choice A comes from, I think that's like 35% of 140 would be 49. Yes. Does that make some sense? It's just that I think it seems right. I think that's where, where that comes from. Um, so be careful, right? Don't just see two numbers and be like, oh, 35% of 140. It's like, that's not what it's saying, right? It's saying it's going to increase by 35%. So be careful there. It's going to be some number bigger than 140. There's no way around it. So it's either C or D. Okay. Let's talk about calculating this. What's, what this is going to be if we increase it by 35%. Do you have any idea how to increase 140 by 35%? Do you know how to do that? Um, I, I mean, my guess would be Take 35% and uh -huh. add it to it? Yeah, you can do that. It's sort of a two-step way. In fact, let's start there, okay? If you find 30% of one or 35% of 140, we'll find out what that is, and then we can add it to the 140, and that'll give us a 35% increase. Does that make sense? Let's do that real quick. So really, it's just 140 times what? What do we multiply by? Uh, 135. 0 0.35, yeah. right? Yep, multiply by 0.35 or 0 0.35, same thing. And what does that give us? Uh, 49. That gives us 49, right? Which is where answer choice A comes from. A lot of students would pick answer choice A here on this question. You can see why, right? They just do a calculation. Yes. Like, oh, 49, sweet. But that's not the number of employees, right? We're, we've got to add that to the original value, which which is what? So that'd be 49 plus 140. Uh, 140. Which is uh, 189. 189. Answer choice D. Does that make some sense? Yes. Okay. So that totally works, sort of that two-step method, right? Of like find the percent and then mm -hmm. add it back to the original value. That totally works. Let me show you another way to do it that I prefer. I'll show you why here in just, in just a minute, especially if we're talking about a percent increase or percent decrease over time. You have to know this one-step method. Let me show you how this works. Instead of multiplying by 0.35 and then adding it back, you can just take the original value, in this case, 140, and instead of multiplying by 0.35, just multiply by 1.35, 1 1.35. Okay, take a look at that expression real quick. I'm going to show you why this works. First of all, what would 140 times 1 be? 140. 140, right? So this is going to be at least 140. In fact, it's going to be a little bit bigger than 140 because we're multiplied by something a little bit bigger than 1. Does that make sense why we know this is going to be bigger than one? Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. But it's not just, uh, you know, it is a little bit bigger than, than one. It's exactly 35% bigger than one because 0.35 means 35%. So if we multiply 140 times 1.35, that automatically in one step increases 140 by 35%. Does that make some sense? It does. Yeah, yes. yeah. Punch that in your calculator real quick. Let's just make sure that. The math works here. I think it should, but go ahead and multiply. 140 yeah, times. it's 189. Yeah, yeah, there you go. It's 189, all right, in one step, okay? 
Now, this is important because sometimes they're asking you to like structure expressions like over time. Something's increasing mm -hmm. by like 35% every year. It's going to look like like that, you know, for if T is the number of years. And um, and and so you do have to know sort of that one step way of doing things. We've got a percent decrease com uh, question coming up next where it is over time. So I really recommend getting getting familiar with that one step method. If it's percent increase, you, you should be multiplying by something bigger than one. And if it's percent decrease, right. you should be multiplying by something less than one. Does that make some sense? Okay. Yes. Okay. Now let's say let's say you want to increase something by twenty five percent. What would you multiply by? Um, one point twenty five. One point two five. Absolutely. What if you want to multiply this or increase something by thirty percent? What should you multiply by? One point thirty. One point thirty. Absolutely. What if you want to multiply or uh, increase something by fifty percent? What should you multiply by? One point fifty. Yeah, 1.5 or 1.50. What if you want to increase something by 90%? What should you multiply by? 1.90. 1.90, absolutely. Questions about that? Or does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay, great, great. All right. This one gets a little bit trickier here. This is a percent decrease over time question. Right. Oh, fun. oh yeah oh yeah have you have you seen any of these on <laughs> on practice tests yes. on the kids? yeah yeah they like these right but I, once you have the foundation of sort of the the concepts that we we worked on in the early questions this this is going to make perfect sense okay go ahead and read uh, number five for us please a certain stock initially worth two hundred dollars loses twenty percent of its value every year which of the following expressions represents the value of stock after some number of years t Ooh, what are we solving for here bailey um, the value of the stock after some years. The, the, yep, the value of the stock after some number of years. In this case, that's that's T is the number of years. Okay, this is a tough question for a lot of students because like these expressions all look pretty similar, and it's just like, man, I don't know how to structure that stuff. Like this is just, it's just, it, it's just tough. It's not obvious looking at the answer choices what the right answer is. It's just not obvious. Okay, one place to start, and this is where you, I mean, good heavens, you worked your way through the course. You know, I love plugging in values. That's a place to start. <laughs> it's a place to start here, right? We can plug in some values for You're T right. and like see what's reasonable. That's a great place to start, right? Even if you don't know how to structure it. Okay, we're going to talk about that as well. I want you to know the operations too. But let's start just mm -hmm. by plugging in values and doing like basic logic and estimation. Okay, okay. so like let's start with a one for T. Right. Like, let's see how much okay. is going to be how much the stock is going to be worth after one year. Does that make some sense? Yes. OK. Now, before we calculate this, we're going to plug in, you know, make make T equal one. We'll plug that into the answer choices before we do that. I mean, could you estimate how much the stock is going to be worth after a year? Like, I just want to see if we can sort of anticipate what the right answer choice might look like. What do you think? How much um, is going to be left after one year? Like after it loses the 20 percent? Yeah, after it loses the 20 percent. So that would be yeah after one year. Uh, like you, you don't have to calculate here, but it's going to be a little, right? It's going to be a little bit less than two hundred. Yes, it's going to be. I, I don't know, I mean, like one sixty something. It's like something that. like one sixty. Yeah, I think it might exactly be one sixty, right? Like but that's really reasonable, right? That feels right, yeah. right? It's not, it's not like going to be a hundred dollars. That'd be like 50, going down fifty percent, right? Um, so, but it's going to be a little bit less than than two hundred. Okay, so plug in a one for T. In the answer choice A, okay, I'll, I'll just write it out for the sake of simplicity okay. here. So that's going to be 200 times 0.8 to the power of 1. Now, what is something to the power of 1? What does that mean, by the way? It's it's just multiplying it by itself. It's just, yeah, it's just, just by itself, basically. It's, so, yeah, it's, it's 0.8 once, <laughs> one time, right? So, yeah. So anything to the power of 1 is itself. So that's just 200 yeah. times 0.8. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, punch that in your calculator. Tell me what you get. What's 200 times 0.8? Uh, it's 160. It's 160, which is nice, right? I mean, that's like kind of what we anticipated. Yeah. Now, hold on, hold on. I mean, don't, we just talked about this earlier in a previous question. Don't just stop when you see something that looks good. Right. Especially when you're plugging in values. They're designing answer choices. Knowing that students are going to use this method, it's the most powerful and useful method there is on all these standardized tests. So mm -hmm. you got to test them all. But that looks pretty good right now. We'll keep answer choice A. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's plug into answer choice B. So that's going to be, you know, it's going to be... The same theory, similar here. It's going to be 200 times 0.2 to the power of one, which is 200 times 0.2. But what does that equal? Right. Uh, 40. 40. Do you think that's the value of the stock after one year? 
No. No way. That's way too small. Is that clear, Bailey? Yes. And it's so funny because I'm guessing one of the most commonly picked answer choices on a question like this is going to be answer choice B. Maybe, That's the first one I thought of. Yes. Was. Maybe especially for students that are familiar with percentages because they see 20% in the question and they're like, oh, sweet, 20%. That's 0.2. Must be answer choice B or D, right? And it's, it's a totally reasonable thing to think. But when you start plugging in values and thinking in concrete terms with it, with the numbers, you get a ridiculous value for answer choice B. Yeah. doesn't make sense. It's not B. We can get rid of it. Does that make sense, Bailey? Yeah, I'm in stats, so that's yeah. what I initially thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And, the, and, and it's, it's tricky because they're developing these answer choices based on common misconceptions about math. Um, yeah. You know, I get it, you know, but, uh, but just make sure, you know, as, as much as you can, plug in values and think in concrete terms and you avoid a lot of the pitfalls. Okay. Let's plug gotcha. in answer choice C. And so that's going to be 0.8 times 200 to the power of one. That's just 0.8 times 200. What's that equal? And it also gives you 160. Also 160, right? It's the same calculation as 200 times 0.8. It's the same thing. So we got to keep B for right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's try answer choice D. What does that give us? It's 0.2 times 200. Um, it's the same as B. It's, it's just the same, same calculation, right? It's going to give us 40. So that's ridiculous. That doesn't work. That's way too small. Questions about that or does that make some sense? That makes sense. Okay. Okay. So, uh, look, we've plugged in some values. We got rid of two of the answer choices. But we, we didn't confirm the right answer yet. What do we do, Bailey? What do we do? Uh, can we plug in another value? Plug in another value. You know the drill. Absolutely, <laughs> right? So let's do it. Let's just plug in a two. And let's see what happens. Okay, now it's gonna, we're, we're done with B and D. We know that doesn't work um, uh, for one. So it's not going to work. For, it doesn't matter. If it, you know, like it's, B and D are just gone. Yeah. So let's plug in answer choice A. So now we're making T equal two. So you got to be careful here. We're raising 0.8 to the power of 2. Okay. Right, so 0.8 times 0.8. So it's 0.8 times 0.8. Yeah, exactly. Be be really careful here, guys. You know, anybody watching the recording, you're not squaring the 200. You're just squaring the 0.8. That's 0.8 squared or 0.8 times 0.8. Same thing. And then you multiply it by 200. So what does that give us? Yes. 200 times 0.64. Perfect. This gives us 128. 128. Yeah, great. You got it. Go, go and write it out. Great. Okay. So does that seem reasonable? Could that be the value of the stock after two years when this thing is losing 20% every year? Could that be the after value of the stock? After two years? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, after two years. That's really reasonable, right? Because if it goes down to 160 after one year, then another 20% decrease will take us down a little bit less than 160. That's reasonable. Keep answer choice A. Okay, let's plug into answer choice C. Now, answer choice C, remember, we're plugging in that two for T, so now we're squaring the 200. And already that's looking pretty suspicious if you know what it means to square something, right? Right? But like, let's yeah. calculate it. I want to show you why it doesn't probably work. <laughs> Which I'm like, oh, that's a big number. Yeah, that's 200 times 200. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, whoa. That's a big number. Do you think that's the value of the stock after two years if it's losing 20% of its value? A hard pass. Yeah, yeah, probably, probably not for uh, that answer choice. So so that is, uh, answer choice C is gone. We can confirm it's answer choice A, which it is. Does that make some sense? Yes. Okay, good. good. I love plugging in values. Good heavens, it works, works beautifully there. Let's talk about sort of the operation now, though, okay? Um, if we wanted to calculate a 20% decrease, okay, I'm going to clear some space here on the whiteboard. Give me just a second. Do you mind helping me clear this? I've, I've, I've got access yeah, to clear no my problem. stuff, but not yours. Yeah, just, let me clear all this stuff. There we go. Okay, good. Okay, so if you want to decrease something by 20%, okay, you, you could do that whole thing where you calculate 20% of something, and then, and then instead of adding this case, we'd subtract it. Right. So let, right. let's do that. Right. If 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 uh, let's say after one year, right, this stock is losing 20 percent of its value, it would just be 200 times 0.2. Right. That's 20 percent of 200. What does that give us, by the way? It gives us 40. It gives us 40. And then you subtract that from 200 and it gives you what? It gives you 160. It gives you 160. Right. Which is 
what we got when we plugged in a one for T to answer choice A and answer choice C. But that also just okay. feels reasonable, right? Okay, it's originally 200 bucks, but it goes down 20%. Something a little less than 200, 160 works perfectly for me. So the decrease, if we if we multiply 200 times 20% or 0.2, we'll calculate the decrease. So then you got to subtract that decrease yes. in the original value to get what you're left with. Does that make some sense? Yes. Okay. So, but a better way to do it, if you're de you can do it in one step. If you're decreasing something by 20%, how much is left if it's going down by 20%? How much, what percentage is left if it goes down by 20%? 80%. 80%. So instead of calculating 20% and subtracting it, just find 80% of 200. That actually makes sense. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, <laughs> so what do you multiply 200 by to find 80% of it? Uh, point zero point, uh, not 0.08. Not 0.0, that would be 8%. Interesting. Sorry, point 0.8. Point zero point 0.8 or point 0.8, yeah. Yeah. If it's going down by 20%, that means there's only 80% left every year that goes by. And it that's why, yes, and that gives you 160, right? And then depending on what T is, like it, it'll, the, after two years, it's basically, it's going to be another 20% decrease because you're multiplying by 0.8 again if T is two. Or if T is three, you're multiplying by 0.83 times, basically. You're dropping it down 20% three times if you're multiplying by 0.8 three times. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's why the right answer is answer choice A. Okay. So if you kind of understand kind of the, the structure of that, if you, if you want to decrease something by 25%, let's say, what should you multiply by if you want to decrease it by 25%? Uh, if you want to decrease it by 25 wait, yeah. say that again? Yeah, if you want to decrease something by 25%, it's going down 25%, what should you multiply by? Um, you should multiply it by 75? 75% or 0. 0.75. Yeah, 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 yeah. What if you want to decrease something by 30%? What should you multiply by? Uh, 70, 0. 0.70. Yeah, 70% or 0. 0.7. It's the same thing. Yeah. What if you want to decrease something by 40%? What should you multiply by? Uh, 60. 60% or 0. 0.6. Yeah. What if you want to decrease something by 60%? What should you multiply by? 40. 40% or 0. 0.4. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so you can kind of think in those terms if you're familiar with how to structure a percent decrease question. And we, we yeah. talked a little bit about percent increase in the last question as well. Or or just plug in the values as well. You can avoid a lot of the traps. You've got some options. But I want to show you both ways of thinking about it. Your best Thank bet you. here really is probably plug in the values, right? Because then you don't have to think about yes. how to structure it exactly. But be aware that the percent increase or decrease is always going to be the term like in parentheses, right? So if you're seeing you're multiplying by 0.8 in parentheses, you know, raised to some power, that signifies a 20% decrease. If you're multiplying by 0.2 in parentheses, that's going to signify an 80% decrease. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. that does. Yeah. And if you're multiplying by 200, good heavens, that's a massive increase. 2,000% <laughs> or 20,000. It's not even, not happening, man. Not happening here. Questions about this? Uh, no. Okay, good. Have you seen any questions like this on, on the, the test you took or on some of the practice tests? Yes. Yeah. They have a lot of the decreasing yep. and increasing yep. values. Yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe start with plug-in values, but... Um, but uh, you can kind of confirm that if you understand how to structure it as well. So let's take a look at some geometry questions now that they're testing on, uh, on the TSI, all right?